Howdy, how's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Rain Race Podcast. Uh, once again, at an awfully inconsistent time, um, I, I'm pretty sure. What Kyle? When's the last time we did an actual Monday episode? Uh, probably like two weeks ago. Really? I thought even then we were yeah. on. A, we were on Tuesday. Honestly, this podcast has been happening more on Tuesday than um, than Monday. So completely. You know, if you haven't already yet, you're more than welcome to start ignoring our um, our little time uh, schedule for this podcast because today we're not only not doing it on Monday, but it's also 8.30. Um, obviously, this is supposed to go Mondays at 8. Uh, yesterday, Kyle was busy and I was working on editing a video and leeway into that is that I'm sorry, a segue into that, show would kill me, <laughs> is that uh, that video will be premiering on my channel at 10 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, which is just under an hour and a half from now. So if you're sticking around for this podcast, you'll be here at the end. Hopefully we'll wrap this up right before the start of that. You can watch the premiere of that video along with me. I'll be in the chat, uh, and it can be a nice, fun time. Anyways, we are doing an Indianapolis 500 preview episode today. And I guess I didn't give you a proper introduction. Kyle, you're back. Yeah, yeah, we're back. We're you're doing back. things. Uh, you know, Super Sub Joe last week did a pretty nice job to the point where yeah, I... Yeah, he's going to take my job. Yeah, yeah, I feel a little threatened, huh? Yeah, a little threatening. Uh, you know, you're also... We may have a, a, a guest pop in and out here every once in a while because of where Kyle is at this moment. Uh, Kyle, you want to just introduce around, introduce for him, I guess, at this time. Hey, David. Well, there you wow. go. He's here. I heard a great disturbance in the forest. People were talking about him. There's Burnett. You didn't make a t-shirt, did you? Because you, you owe me 10% royalties when you make a t-shirt with uh, one of my tweets on. What? <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I bought a box of micro machines today. I'm in a good mood. I'm ready to get on the Rain Race podcast, talk about anything but the Indy 500. I'm contractually obligated. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just going to say, you know, the last time you were on this podcast was the uh, the pandemic special, right after that whole shebang started. Well, I'm in a right much better Pete. mood now than I was then. Yeah, that's that's good. Uh, Has it really been that long? Yeah. Well, because we kind of stopped like, doing honest, the podcast I don't even for... Remember that. We stopped doing the podcast, Kyle. After we did the Braden episode, after that, and then we did nothing until January, right? That's not us at all. No, that wouldn't be us. Oh, first weird. car I pulled out of this box of micro machines. Good all sign. Right. Well, there you go. A little bit of an informal introduction, but we got David Land in the background, uh, playing with some micro machines. So I think he's going to be a great asset to this episode. Anyway, Kyle. Let's start things off here. Talk about Indy 500 qualifying this past weekend. Uh, just want some of your takes on that whole ordeal um, in terms of where you surprised and who was sent home, and uh, what do you think about what it means for the race this weekend? Uh, well, my take on the whole deal overall, uh, I found it like most people really confusing uh, how the whole thing went down. But um, as far as those going home. Uh, obviously, Arner, R.C. Anderson going home wasn't a huge surprise. Uh, I think everyone kind of put them on their list to, to go home, which actually got David in trouble. Uh, no, that's not what got me in trouble. <laughs> whatever. What got me in trouble was uh, doubting that they would show up in the first place. T-Motor Bill Throckmorton did not take that very lightly. Right. But it, but it all worked out in the end. In fact, um, you know, Top Gun is uh, that's an interesting story going forward. Uh, the journey, I'll just put it this way, has not ended with them getting bumped at the Indy 500. Yes. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I thought that they were a given in the beginning. They weren't a huge surprise. Um, Charlie Kimball, kind of a surprise. Uh, if you were to, you know, if you would have told me that Charlie Kimball was getting bumped uh, before, you know, the week of practice started, I wouldn't have believed you. But as the week went on, you could definitely tell that that was one of the cars uh, on the on the bubble to get bumped that weekend. And um, I would, one of the surprises to me was Pietro Fittipaldi, I think, and the speed shown from them. Um, I think we kind of had them on their list, and the whole Dale Coyne team, uh, they uh, honestly uh, didn't look all that fast, uh, but then once the the race, the qualifying boost kicked in, 
Uh, it was apparent that the Hondas, and because they were Honda powered, uh, they had an upper hand uh, to not be bumped. So, I mean, uh, there were a few surprises, few, few non-surprises um, and on qualifying weekend. You know what's really disappointing is that Cody had, you know, bump day was really kind of boring, but I think had Cody Ware been there, he would have been really the chicken in the hen house with a really powerful Honda motor. And, um, you know, he probably would have been in that bottom six still. And I think that would have really upset the apple cart because if Will Power had had to go and make another run, I think uh, we might be t- telling a bit, bit of a different story about who was in and who was out. Tell you what. I find interesting is after last year where Marco Andretti was you just barely inched out Scott Dixon to get the pole position. Actually, no, now I'm thinking back at it, Kyle. This is a bump back to what I was saying, but I was trying to remember what podcast we were doing. We did a podcast last year right before the Indy 500. I remember doing that now. Maybe we would have one right after as well, but whatever. It's a little bit off topic. Um, so, yeah, Marco Andretti barely inched out Scott Dixon last year. We get into the race, and his pace is absolutely nowhere, which seems like this year he's been more committed towards setting up a good race car than a qualifying car. Um, where I'm going with this note is that one thing that surprised me a little bit was the lack of pace we saw in qualifying from the Ray Hall Letterman Lanigan cars. I certainly expected to see them in the, uh, at least one of them in the fast nine. And honestly, I didn't say it out loud, but my quiet pick for poll was going to be Takuma Sato this weekend. Uh, perhaps they're focused entirely on race trim right now, but I really expected to see at least one of those cars in the fast nine. I don't know about you guys. They, yeah. timed, they timed it wrong. They uh, they were slow in their first run. They made the adjustments, but um, they just weren't in, in that lane two in the right spot, and Takuma was ready to go out. Probably would have gone in the fast nine, but it was uh, all the bump day crowd that was getting in lane one, you know, the, the lane that you actually have to pay to get into with your with your time. And um, I think they would have made it had they made a second run, but they just never did. So, you know, uh, it's going to be tough coming up from the mid-pack. I will say that. I yeah. think that's going to be a really tall ask for anybody. I, I think the random – I mean, obviously, the, the time they went out for their first run and then obviously the way the bumping works um, on uh, the first day – you know, kind of limits you with how many runs you get to make a shot of the fast nine because, you know, to when you have all those guys using lane one to try to bump into the top 30, uh, you might only get one run at the fast nine if you're one of the faster cars. Uh, but, I mean, I think something interesting to point out here with the Ray Hall Letterman team, uh, if you look at the whole season, the Ray Hall team has looked, like, terrible in qualifying. I remember Barber, I think Sato and Graham were, like, the... Uh, right in front of Jimmy in the back. I mean, they they qualified terrible, and I don't think you know in the in the other races that have happened, their qualifying has been good at all. But I mean, if you look at the actual race, they're usually you know Sato and Graham in the top ten, top five. So I mean, it it's really something that's been a theme of the entire season, and I I wouldn't count them out even if they're running mid pack. I know I know Graham has had some quotes this week of saying you know that the the car feels literally feels better when it's running third in line. You know, it's just whether or not you can make a pass. Uh, but I mean, it's Sato, so I just, I would not count them out whatsoever. Where did Sato start last year? He was on the front row, right? Third, third. Okay, because um, you know the thing that I noticed with Sato last year is that he was hands down the only car really at the end that had a prayer of putting it to Dixon, and in the end ended up doing that quite successfully with uh, the victory last year uh yeah i have a lot of confidence with the ray hall letterman cars and race trim i think i certainly wouldn't discount them being one of if not the strongest teams for race trim i obviously chip ganassi's up there right now as well uh, another team worth talking about that got brought up in the chat tara said did anybody try to scratch off the chevy stickers on the ecr cars to check if there was a honda honda sticker underneath uh and i think that's a great talking point right there Ed Carpenter Racing, I don't want to say that they're not on form because they've always been pretty spectacular in Indianapolis qualifying, but I think certainly turned some eyes this weekend with how impressive their runs were across the board. I mean, it's obviously rigged, right? <laughs> well, what, I mean, what was your theory? You know, um, Tony George <laughs> sells a Speedway for a, for a 10% discount to Roger for giving them that 10 horsepower boost. But... um. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I got to talk about that, though. I mean, Renus VK, right when he was going out, 
um, what was he like the the fifth car to go? I'm trying to remember what what the order the what the order was on Sunday. Um, but you know, I thought right when he put that lap up, I thought that was going to be a lap to hold pole. Um, and then sure enough, he ended up getting moved down by Herta and Scott Dixon. But you know, Ed Carpenter Racing. The thing about them is that while they've been very good in qualifying, I don't remember the last time they've actually been a genuine contender to win. Um I'm trying to think back in the arrow kit era. Their best shot. Yeah, their best shot was twenty eighteen. And then maybe in twenty fourteen if Hinchcliffe hadn't happened. Yeah. Maybe in twenty fourteen. I mean, I think a lot of people would say Renus VK had a great shot last year, and they yeah. just screwed up in the pits. So, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I think VK is going to really impress. Uh, I don't. The the question, and and I actually have a video coming where I talk about all of this stuff tomorrow. But um, one of the things I think is that uh, you know Ed Ed's team and um, Pato may really be in the catbird seat if it's a fuel mileage race and like we've seen throughout the season both the texas and the ndgp are the most like blatant examples uh if the chevy is the most efficient engine uh i would imagine that those teams and drivers are looking pretty good um if it's not an if it's not a mileage race um and then you start looking at uh, i think probably being a ganassi versus andretti uh showdown yeah because like you look at texas race two uh, when at the very end, when it came down to fuel mileage and New Garden and Pato just took off, and Graham and Dixon had to, you know, backed off almost like 10 seconds. I think Graham backed off like 10 seconds to New Garden just saving fuel, which is something Pato and New Garden didn't have to deal with. I remember the end of that race, I I was just thinking that McLaren was going to screw up somewhere and run out Pato because there was no way that they could push that hard. Uh, but I mean, it's Chevy has the fuel mileage, and, you know, they looked bad in qualifying. Uh, but I think that was mostly because of the qualifying boost. I think in race trim, they've they've looked uh, pretty great. So I mean, they're they're kind of stuck in the back. You know, they're they're not they don't have the the greatest starting spots, obviously. But I mean, uh, I think one of the great equalizer is going to be the race boost. And I you know, guys like Ed Carpenter and and Rena, especially Rena's uh, starting third, where you know last year's winner started. Like you mentioned, I mean, and the first Dutch winner started. Ari Leindijk in his first 1990 went started on the outside of the front row, and a lot of people really didn't consider him a a favorite uh, going into that race, and uh, proved everybody wrong. Also, Chevy power. So a lot of there's a lot of things like that going on this year. Let me let me point well, this out. Heard is the other one. Let me po- point this out real quick. So not only is is Renus you know starting you know where last year's winner started and you know where Leindijk started, he, Colton Herta, uh, the last time the uh, 26 car. Won at St. Petersburg before the 500. Also won the 500. Colton Herta won at St. Pete this year. Yeah. What was the, there was another Brian one. Herta. So Brian Herta, it's the first year on the box calling strategy for Colton Herta. We're expecting that this race will be very much a strategy race. The you know how you're going to win it. Um, you look at uh, it's been five years since 2016 when Brian Herta and Alexander Rossi won the Indianapolis 500, and ten years, five years uh, later after. After 2016, or before 2016, was the 2011 500, which Dan Weldon won, race called by Brian Herta. We're now uh, 10 years away from that. Brian Herta, Colton Herta, strong edge ready power, um, and a young, hungry driver who, you know, I think is probably going to be due pretty soon for a 500 win. I, I, there's a lot of interesting stories. Um, uh, it would be... It, it, it's, but then again, it could also just be a Felix Rosenquist win, and we're going to have to figure out some way to to mythicize that. So, you know, one thing. By the I've... way, clip that if you get it. <laughs> one thing I heard talked about a lot um, throughout practice by the NBC crew was they seem to believe that veteran drivers at Indianapolis will have an advantage because they know the tricks to the trade. I guess when it comes to driving at IMS. Um, in terms of how you manage a 500 mile race rather than just single lap pace there uh so i'm looking back at the starting grid right now out of the top six we have three what i would call highly veteran drivers and scott dixon ed carpenter and tony Kanon. and then you have three relatively new drivers which is colton Herta, renas vk and alex polo um you know i'm trying to wonder if that's gonna play a factor as well uh you know i'm thinking when you were saying Colton Herta, you know, he's hungry for a, for any success this season. He's already a championship contender. 
Um, only has a few years of, of uh, experience at the 500 under his belt. I'm just wondering, you know, we have an equal match there, three and three. I'm wondering if we're going to see the veterans uh, really start to show their tricks or if the, the young guns are going to be able to pull off the aggressive strategy throughout this race. I think that's what I think that's what we're going to remember this race for. To be quite honest, I think um, we're at the crossover point where the old legends are beginning to uh, to um, end their careers, and the the young guns are beginning to uh, start their careers and really come into their own. So, in a lot of ways, this is kind of like the the ninety two to ninety five era of the Indy five hundred, where you had all these legends, but you also had all these new young drivers. And this race is really going to be um, who's going to carry things forward for the next couple of years. Is it still going to be the veterans or is it going to be the 20 somethings? It's going to be, and like, uh, it's literally an even split. Like you said, not only in the first two rows, but really the fast nine was split between guys who we expect to be around for quite a while and guys who have been around for quite a while. Another huge story from this weekend. I know you already made a video about it, David is Penske. <laughs> Will power. 32nd uh, on the starting grid for the Indianapolis 500. Who had that on their uh, on their bets before that weekend? I don't think I don't think anybody really did. Um, Penske, you know the interesting thing about them is that they've seen like one of the strongest teams in race trim. We get to the qualifying though, you know, and and let's see if I can find day one results from qualifying. Um, Will Power. Oh, see, there's, there's going to mix all of them up. Well, it's in the car app. You're not going to get anything from the day one results because Will Power qualified faster than Dalton Kellett's at time. Well, right. But I'm just saying, you know, who expected to see Will Power in the last, in the, uh, yeah, the last row shootout? And then looking at the starting grid, you have Simon Pagano down in 26th, Simona Di Silvestro, which is a heavily Penske affiliated car, starting 33rd. Um, but then you look at the practice results from right after qualifying, same day, Sunday, will drivers like will power up in 11th, um, Scott McLaughlin's 15th. I mean, they're not, you know, top five right, on the, pace. The thing but... about practice, the thing about practice is you can't really judge the speeds based on how, you know, how good they look. Right. Right. You have to actually watch and when they go out there in those big packs, that's what you have to be looking for. And all week, Simona's car has been looking David just found a gold micro machine. Uh, yeah, that's that's that could be a fifty dollars maybe. But anyway, yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, I think I think Kyle, you know, and, and Chris, I think you guys are missing a little bit here because you think about Penske and they were slow last year. The right. reason we didn't talk about it was there was no bumping last year. Um, it seems like the aero screen uh, that that changed the you know they were on the pole two years ago and now here we are and they're on the last row. Um, with two cars, tech, you know, honestly, and some DARFs are claiming that the that the Peretta car isn't a Penske car. Um, Tim Sindrick has spent an awful lot of time in that garage for it to not be a Penske car. I'll just throw that out there for everybody. Right. But yeah, I don't think it's as much of a surprise as as maybe. I mean, it's a surprise in the sense that it's Will Power, a guy who's won this race before. Um, and not like a Scott McLaughlin, but at the same time, you know, it, it's hard to have not seen this coming too. Uh, if you kind of look at it objectively and say, wow, Hey, you know, they, they weren't that fast last year and nothing. And there really hasn't been that great a change in the package between this year and last year. That was something I think I actually thought about last year. I, something, I think you tweeted that, um, the, the last year when Penske was in the back, they looks like that bet Penske's, uh, Bet Penske's glad there's no bumping this year because right. they would have been in trouble. They would have been hustled, you know. And 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 if you think about it, we were going into 2020 thinking we were gonna have 36, 37, 38 cars. Right. There were a lot of guys who dropped out due to the pandemic who would have been there otherwise. Um, you know, it's there again. And then Penske's lucky there wasn't a Cody Ware there because where I I'm telling people, Cody Ware with a Honda engine would have been fast enough to threaten um simona yes yeah and threaten her enough that she probably would have done something stupid like we saw with dalton kellett and willpower the previous day they would have been you know scrambling and that's when those mistakes are made we see that um that's kind of the magic of bump days we see all those mistakes being made and oftentimes it's just like you look in retrospect and you go oh my god why'd you do that you would have easily made the show but 
you know. All right, so Sunday, and I guess this was a thing on Saturday as well, um, we had seen Charlie Kimball and R.C. Enerson. Um, they put their initial run in and then sat on the pit lane and pretty much sat there for what was 30 to 40 minutes. I think that was a huge talking point in terms of how can we change the format because we have the clock ticking down and there's absolutely no activity going on. This is horrible for TV. Um, You know, I'm sure it would have been a much different scene if we had more cars there. Actually, certainly would have been a different scene if we had more than two cars up for bumping. Um, Now, the reasoning for them being stationary on pit road that long was uh, evidently to cool the engines down so they could get as much pace out of the cars as possible. I don't remember that being certainly as much of an issue previous years though when we've had bumping i don't know if i'm just remembering it incorrectly admittedly i've missed some of the bump days in the past few years due to work and other things it's also been two years since we've had bump day well well, here's here's a couple things so a lot of people remember the bump days of old which were literal all day affairs you ran like they opened the track at noon and anybody could make a run at any time between the hours of noon and six uh, it's, things are different now. And the last time we had bump day, it was a one and done run. That's really because the reason Fernando Alonso missed the show um, was because he didn't get another crack at it. Um, and because it, the this was actually what's interesting is this was actually the format that was supposed to happen in 2019, but it rained and so they had to condense it. Right. And but the other problem is, and the reason you're talking about cooling the engines, well, in the past. Bump day, the most exciting part of bump day, when you saw everybody in the line, was when the track was rapidly cooling off in what we usually describe as happy hour. Um, And so, you know, it's funny. We changed this format for TV to run it at noon so that TV will be able to show it. And that's well and good and fair enough. Believe me, I'm not going to bitch at somebody for running, trying to put on motorsports at noon. But in this case, running later is much better. I mean, ultimately, you're going to have a much better show um, um, if the track conditions are tempting enough and you don't have park Ferme rules, which they did for this, if the teams can just thrash and thrash and thrash on the cars, throw dry ice on the engine to cool them down, whatever you got to do, I'd rather see that than whatever farce we witnessed. Um, and, and, you know, it's still, I don't want to necessarily, I think farce is still probably too strong because ultimately we still had moments that were legendary bump day style things like Will Power knocking the wall down and still running 229 mile an hour average. I mean, that's a insane yeah uh you caught me at a moment where i don't know what to say no no you caught me at a moment where i like had nothing to say um (laughs) hey you know what perfect opportunity to read the chat while we're on the topic of talking about the last row shootout and bump day on sunday uh wolfer said i thought top gun would make it since the other non-affiliated independent new teams like harding carlin and dragon speed made it I'll be honest, I'm kind of on the same page as you. I was saying this to Kyle, or telling this to Kyle throughout the weekend that I wasn't really ready to sort of count uh, Top Gun out strictly because of how many times in the past we had said, all right, well, I'll tell you what, Hunkos isn't going to make it, or uh, Dragon Speed certainly isn't going to make it. Um, I just assume that there's a potential that we get another situation like this. Well, let me let me go through this. Let me go through this. This is interesting. So, there's you have you listed Carding, Harding, Carlin and Dragon Speed. Uh Harding in 2017 when they first came, they they didn't have to deal with bumping, did 2017. 2017 no. They did so when they but first they wouldn't have had to deal with it anyway because they were so fast. And... Sure. I mean, yeah, but the point is they didn't have to deal with bumping anyways. And I mean, I the more I think about it, Harding was kind of like Top Gun, where they just kind of came out of nowhere in the beginning. But by the time there was bumping, they were and they were established and Andretti affiliated. So it was like, so I mean that was. But then when Carlin, and, 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 you know, it's it's also important to note not so much in 2017 but 2018, the Chevrolet was very much even to, into 2019. The Chevy was very much the powerful engine. So when we're talking about Hunkos and we're talking about Dragon Speed and we're talking about Boston Marshall, those cars were powered by the best engine. I think Top Gun makes it if they've got an H on their clothes and not a bow tie. Yeah. You know, that's the same thing I said about Cody Ware. I think he would have been the chicken in the hen house 
there because he would have been a driver who perhaps maybe couldn't hang it out 110%, but I bet he could have hung it out enough to run a 229 average. I mean, it's Carlin and Dragon Speed. These are, you know, well-established teams that, you know, are huge. I'm not saying, you know, Top Gun didn't know what they were doing, but I mean, all, already, the, how how many days? 40 days before they were on yeah, track? Yeah, they in a box. Like, they just... Like, the car came in a box 40 days before they were on track. And I, you know, I'm not saying they don't know what they're doing. I mean, honestly, before you, unless you know, you know, you don't know Top Gun Racing. I mean, it's, but I mean, what they did to get on track in itself was impressive. And I mean, it's just a, like David said, if they had an H on their, on their shirt instead of a, the Chevy, I mean, they're in and that's impressive enough. I, Once again, another another time where I'm caught off guard. <laughs> um, so, Kyle, you mentioned earlier you were saying when you're at the track, especially, it's able to see you're able to see who's able to run in traffic better and who has what seems to be the better race car. I was sort of limited to what I was able to watch on Peacock's coverage throughout the week, which wasn't as much as I would have loved because of other commitments and stuff to take care of. Uh, so, you were at the track pretty much all week. And I guess David Always can chime in on this as well. Uh, I just want to hear some of your thoughts on who had what looked like some of the best cars to race with in a pack, uh, or at least conditions that we'll see similar to the race on Sunday. Uh, Ray Hall, Sato. Um, I mean, Dixon looked all right. Dixon's, I mean, Dixon's always fast. He, yeah. Uh, the Daily, Elio, Herder, Rossi, McLaughlin. Yeah, Daily looked really good. I remember that. I mean, the the Penske's looked pretty solid. But McLaughlin's the one who's furthest up in the field. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I'm kind of picking him above, like, power, because power, I think, is going to need strategy to even get it, have it, to have a hope. And we saw how that worked for them, for them last year. They were lapped down most of the race. Uh, my feeling is there were two days in a row of practice where at the very end we just saw, you know, Ray Hall and Dixon swapping the lead. And every time I saw them do that, I was just, I, I'm envisioning that as the finish of the race, honestly. Okay, so I'm, qualify better. I'm trying to remember last year's race now because my next question is when we're talking about Scott Dixon put out an enormous time in qualifying, um... I assume he's going to be a driver that has the advantage when he's out in front. Uh, I don't know if you've been able to see how well that car... I know you just sort of mentioned that he has an okay car in traffic. Um, probably not the best in the field, though. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure I'm... that their strategy is they want to stay as, in front as long as they can, or at least you know, maybe second or third where they're not behind a bunch of cars in dirty air. Well, I'll um, give you a hint, Chris. The uh, Dixon Scott Dixon lost last year's Indianapolis 500 specifically because he probably could have led all 200 laps and chose not to. Yep. So I think this year, if he can, I've heard a little bit that the leader is going to be a sitting duck, but of course that depends who you ask and where they're starting in the field. Um, I My thought and my strategy, if I'm Scott Dixon, is I correct the mistake last year and I make that car as wide as possible the entire race. I stay out front, keep that clean air, control the race, and um, and keep all of the young, hungry chargers away from that front. Well, that's exactly what I was going to say, because as I remember correctly, or if I remember correctly, I should say, Dixon only gave the spot to Sato last year to try to save fuel because he wasn't sure if he was going to make it. Um, that is such a Dixon way to lose the and race. Then, and then he <laughs> just wasn't able to pass Sato again. That's but from... he also was like, oh, I could have passed him, but I was just waiting for the last lap. And it's like, what are you doing, dude? Because <laughs> he was mad about they, they didn't uh, throw the red and try to get the race restarted. It's like, you lost the, you gave the lead up. You gave the lead up in the biggest race in the world. This should be a race you want to lead every single lap if you can, regardless of the situation. So, yeah, that was just a, you know, that was Scott Dixon outthinking himself, to be quite honest, I thought. And, and I think he just needs to not think so hard and just go out there and win it. <laughs> and I think you can if he does. Well, I mean, that can be what he claims, but do you actually think he would have been able to pass Sato if, if you know, we make it to the last well, lap under green? No. There was traffic, though. I mean, the, the big factor in that was I always thought it looked it looked like it was setting up for a 1989-style finish where Sato was going to get blocked and Dixon was going to make a desperate move on him. 
And who knows what would have happened? Um, I, I was thinking the entire game. last. I was thinking the last fifteen laps that Graham Rail was going to win that race because, so yeah, just like David said with the traffic. But I mean, Sato was getting through the traffic better than Dixon, like you mentioned. And I, I Chris, I think you and I are on the same page here. Because I, 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 if Dixon stay can stay out front all two hundred laps, you know he's winning the race. If he gets past, if if he has to deal with traffic, I don't think he has a better car than say Sato in traffic or any of the, both the rail cars, and even the Andretti cars. I don't think he has a, as good of a car in traffic. So I mean, if he can lead all two hundred, I think he's golden. If he if he gets past, if there's you know, if it's not the right situation, then I think he has a little bit of work to do. That's not. I mean, at the same time, it's not saying that his car's horrible in traffic. It's probably not as good as a Sato or any of the Andretti cars. Right. Uh, Wolfer has asked another question. Do you think if Dixon finishes in the top five, it's game over for the championship? Certainly not at this stage of the game. Indy is a double points race, which it shouldn't be. Um, but, you know, we have a long season left. Scott Dixon right now is the points leader by 13 points. When you look at the front row, though, all three of the drivers on the front row are all race winners this season already. You have Scott Dixon, Colton Herta, and Renus VK. Um, now granted they're not all top three in the championship. Dixon has the lead. VK is down in sixth and Hurt is in 10th. Um, you know, I think a driver that I would be looking at this weekend, we know Alex Palou is strong. He made that mistake on Saturday. Um, I'm sure that's going to be sitting in the back of his head on race day a little bit, might be a little bit more cautious, uh, especially when trailing behind some cars. Um, you know, perhaps that actually, you know, it's going to sound weird to say, but perhaps that could have been a net positive for him um just being in the car that he is he could have had way too much confidence going into the race and uh, made a mistake that he didn't really have to make whereas i'm sure after that crash on saturday he's going to be a little bit more careful when thinking about stuff like that another driver i look at though is joseph newgarden i mean we've been talking about penske it seems that they're decently strong in race trim so i'm really going to be curious how well they're able to make their way up the field um, you know, depending on strategy, I don't see any reason at all they wouldn't be able to make their way towards the front. We saw Juan Pablo Montoya in 2015 was able to go from last to first after uh, damaging his car early on. I wouldn't be surprised if we were able to see a situation like that again. Um, I mean, the the big the big difference I think between this year and 2015 is that um, at least in race trim, in 15, first of all, you had those bumpers, which allowed right. passing to be so, so easy anywhere in the pack. And the second thing was that, that Chevy had a huge performance advantage. They really nailed the aero kit, and they nailed the engine that year. So Juan Pablo, I mean, and I'm not taking anything away from him, but he had a real hot rod that year, and he could get up to the front. Um, I think it's going to be much more difficult this year to just drive to the front. Again, I think it's strategy and restarts that are really going to get you up there. And I look at especially Newgarden, and, and he's starting behind guys like Jack Harvey and um, and Graham Rahal and Takuma Sato, guys who are starting in that mid-pack. And, and you just have to kind of ask the question, well, can he, you know, is he going to be able to first beat those guys to the front? And then he's going to have to deal with Elio and Polo and Herta and VK and Ed Carpenter and Scott. De so that's just, that's, it's a real tall task to win the 500 from row seven on back in this era. Right. That, I mean, that's why I said I'm looking at strategy specifically. Um, you know, especially if we end up in the later stages of the race where it looks like we might have a split between drivers who decide to pit and drivers who stay out. Uh, we've had a couple of those races in recent years. Taurus asks, do you think the arrow changes for the cars this year will be enough to make a noticeable difference in the ways that, in the way the cars race this year? Um, I certainly want to get David's opinion on that and Kyle's. I think that they're more knowledgeable than me. But another question I want to throw onto that is, you're comparing it to the race last year, which I think is the best comparison we have because that's the current configuration, or mostly the same current configuration of car we have this year with the arrow screen. And the noticeable difference last year was the heat. Uh, obviously, running that race in August, I don't remember the exact temperature. I think it was somewhere in the high 80s. Kyle, you were there, so you could tell me. But, um, uh, this uh, I was looking at the forecast for next Sunday. Uh, obviously, still a little ways out here, so that could change. But it says 73 is the high. So Perfect. weather differences are 
a factor as well. But I do want to jump back to his question on the arrow changes because that's something Kyle and I had talked about yeah. before the month of May even started. I think it was after the open test in the end of April we started talking about the differences that could, that could have for the race itself. I'll, I'll go first. I think David might have a little bit more to say about the arrow changes and what it might you know do. I mean, like we said, I mean, the, the small hole next to the side pod has a little wicker, and then there's like a little thing. And obviously on race day, all the teams are going to be putting all the downforce on it because these cars already, uh, with the wings, don't have that much downforce or that much adjustment. So they're all going to be maxed. And, um, I mean, I think it's going to be better than it was before, at least, I mean, for sure, if you're third in line. Uh, I think in practice, from what we've seen this week, obviously – you can't take practice, you know, 100% because, you know, guys, you know, are being super careful and letting each other by. So, I mean, what you're the passing you're actually going to see in the race is way different. Um, but, I, I mean, uh, we have seen a good bit of passing and battling in practice. Um, and I think it'll at least be better than last year because of the changes. There's still not enough, there's still not enough um, front wing adjustment to create front downforce in these cars, uh, in my opinion, in uh, others' opinions. <laughs> Very significant people's opinions. Uh, short answer to the question of will the racing be better is no. The long answer is um, I think you will see a closer race. Um, part of that is due to the aero changes. Second uh, point would be that it's going to be a cooler race, like you mentioned, Chris. Um, the big thing, I think, is that um, you're not going to be able to see guys get away from each other. I don't know. But at the same time, you know, I, I thought about this today, and I think there's a lot of guys um, – you know, predicting it's going to be a pack race style 2013 race. I don't think that's going to be quite the, the story. Because if you look at the last two years, the race has had a pretty established pattern, which is uh, there, there's a dominant driver who leads most of the race, and then a driver that kind of rises up throughout the race and challenges him late. And um, I, I would expect that that's going to be the race we see. I don't, I don't know how spread out the field is going to be. Um, obviously, it's the closest and fastest field in history. But again, we're judging a lot of that off of how the cars were performing in qualifying trim, which is not even the same race car they're going to be running in the race. So it's it's really tough to be able to judge how close the field is going to be or, or how, how, you know, because I was also told this by a driver who's starting on the front row, um, that drivers or cars just behind, you know, second place loses 20 per, uh, 21% of the overall grip in the vehicle, just running second. So imagine how that changes as you go throughout the field and you're in a, running in a long line like we usually see in the modern era. So I, you know, it, it, I don't necessarily think we're going to see a 2013 style race. Um, I think the, our best hope is that we see some, I mean, last year's race wasn't all that bad and really neither was 2019. Um, so I, I, you know, I think we're just very, very cynical and very, very. Uh, we have very high expectations these days on our racing. Um, I, I think we'll see. I hope we'll see a competitive race, but you know, you never know for sure. Yeah, I pretty much agree with most of the sentiment you just said. I don't know who's been saying they're expecting a 2013 style race because I don't. Some of the drivers. Oh, really? Some of the drivers? Yeah. Oh. Some of the drivers are expecting that you're not going to be able to get away and you don't want to be the leader. I mean, I, I can't sit here and just say the drivers are wrong, but I'd be highly surprised if we ended up with a situation like that. I mean, I know you've described 2013 before as sort of the perfect storm where it was cars that were able to race in a pack in general, which was the spec aero kit DW12. And that race in particular was especially cool for a late May day. Uh, and that just the cloud cover as well just sort of created the perfect storm of conditions for passing that year i'd be extremely surprised if we saw something like that even in the next few years in general um i always look at carb day practice as an indication or i'd say the best indication of what we might see in the race it seems like every single year on the opening week of practice when i mean like the first eight practice sessions um starting tuesday through the final practice after um Sunday qualifying ends usually you'll have these really large lines form up and it's all very nice and exciting you know you could say oh this is what we're going to see in the race potentially this is very nice and the race usually never ends up that way um, carb day practice usually seems a lot more conservative a lot more what 
similar to what we can see in the race itself. Um, and also, most of the teams are going to be running pretty much identical, if not very close to setups that they're going to be running on race day, on carb day. That's why in previous years, uh, I'm just going to point out last year, we saw Marco Andretti topping the sheets, or at least coming very close to topping the time sheets in a lot of the practice sessions, even in race trim. And when we get to carb day, that's when you start to realize that there's an issue. And that happened for him, I think, the year prior as well. Um, so yeah, I would look at carb day if you're looking for any indication. But there's so many variables at play here, namely the weather, that uh, they can just change so much into how these cars handle. So I don't think that there's any true indication on how they're going to drive uh, when we actually get to Sunday. Well, um, I can tell you a big factor of, of why you kind of see the craziness in practice is... Um, versus the race is I think some people get false hope for practice because a lot of the cars that will be running up front and running away from the rest of the field are actually running 20th in line in practice. Right. And oftentimes you have Simona Di Silvestro leading a back and slowing everybody else down behind. So it's tough to kind of judge how the racing is going to be entirely from practice unless you really know that the guys who are running up at the front of that kind of conga line are the guys you know are going to be running up front on race day. Right. Um, no, I'm trying to think of some other talking points that are worth going over here. I don't know if you guys have anything from qualifying that can translate into the race. If you do, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, how did I end up on the championship standings? I don't even know. I guess I do want to talk about Ganassi a little bit because Ganassi, they seem like they've been pretty much the strongest team this week. Um, you know, we've talked about Scott Dixon multiple times, pole sitter for this race. Alex Pillow is looking strong as well. Tony Kanaan, I think, surprised a lot of people. Um, you know, the 48 car, unfortunately, hasn't spent a lot of time at the front in the past few races. Um, but I think that that came as a little bit of a surprise that he's starting fourth. Uh, oh, sorry, no. Oh, no, he's starting fifth. My bad. Um, Erickson, ninth. So I believe Ganassi was the... Did Ganassi get all of their cars in the Fast 9? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, but I think that goes to the point that I, I kind of feel and a few drivers feel is that um, Ganassi is strong in qualifying trim. They might not be so strong in race trim. Um I, I personally believe that it's going to be Ganassi versus Andretti, and that it also includes the two shank cars in that equation for the win outright if it's totally dependent on pace in the race. Um, obviously, there are more factors to that than just just pace, but um, I, I, I'm curious. I, I, I honestly, and you mentioned Kanan, I may think he might be the favorite out of the Andretti, or sorry, the Ganassi side of things because uh, this is the best opportunity he may ever have again. And I think he's going to be well aware of that. And I think one of the key factors to the race is going to be restarts and how you perform on restarts. And who's one of the best in restarts? Tony Kanaan. Certainly. Um, I guess the last thing I want to go over in terms of... Well, not really the last thing, but I do want to talk about reliability. Um Actually, when we look back at the past few races, there's been some reliability issues across both Honda and Chevrolet. Um, Honda had a few issues at the GP. Uh, I'm trying to remember what Alexander Rossi and Colton Herta both ran into a couple of uh, a couple of issues that weekend. Uh, did Board Day run into issues as well? I'm trying to remember if it was so uh, in, in practice. We are. I mean, in the in the race, it's in the in the GP. Um, I can't remember. I don't remember any significant issues. We have had a few significant issues in practice with reliability. Right, because actually, board. When did Bordet have to do an engine change? That was on the first practice, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Um, okay. And and at the same time, Harvey had to change an engine. They they did an install lap, and uh, they've been pretty hush hush about exactly what it was. But we did. I was actually able to confirm that it was a, an engine that they changed. Um, why they did it or why they needed to do that, I I don't know. Um, the, the Chevy issues, which we've seen now both on Sebastian Bourdais and uh, Simon Pagino's cars, uh, have been pretty clearly oil 
coming from the front of the engine and getting on the turbocharger and catching on fire. So um, now those engines uh, that they were planning on using that blew up uh, will not be in the Indianapolis 500. Everybody gets a new engine. So it, it'll be a question of whether Chevrolet was able to solve that problem on the new engines or not. Um, but we've seen two Chevys go and one Honda go throughout practice. So um, it's interesting. There, I think there could be some reliability issues. I mean, we've seen that with Andretti at, at Texas. I keep reminding everybody that their wheel bearings didn't last the entire race for a couple of drivers. So, um, you know, it, it is a 500-mile race. And while they're spent cars, um, there are some things that people can kind of uh, massage a little bit. And sometimes they go a little too far. Well, see, the interesting thing about the reliability issues this year is that it seems like it's a mix of almost an even mix of manufacturer in terms of who has reliability issues. I think a lot of people, when you talk about reliability at Indianapolis, instantly think about 2017. That's where my mind instantly goes when Alonzo brought his curse with Honda. And all of a sudden you have Ryan hunter blowing up. I'm trying to remember who else blew up that month. Oh, well, certainly Alonzo blew up. Yeah. Um, but it is interesting that it's kind of an even mix. And it's a variety of issues, too, um, over the past few races. I think starting at Texas is when we started to see a couple of those issues uh, winding up. Uh, Even had the tire manufacturer have a failure. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Did we actually get any indica- any like word on to what happened to Jack Harvey's car from Firestone? Because Not necessarily official, but I think most people have kind of pointed to a manufac- just a manufacturing error. Uh, just a tire that wasn't built right somehow got through quality control and ended up on the uh, rear end of the 60 car. So I'm trying to think of how that exactly happened because it certainly wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been worn out like that on the pit lane or when they put the tire on. So how would it wear out? It was, a, it was like a manufacturer. It is, like, that is a good point. Like, how does that even happen? How does that even happen that way? What, what has to like, what even, you know, I, what... I wouldn't be, Sorry to interrupt, Kyle, but I wouldn't be like wildly surprised if you saw something like that at the end of a long practice run. But he had run essentially six laps, and the tire had looked was, like that. It, I mean, it had started as soon as he he yeah. came by the first time, and it sounded wrong. So that tire delaminated almost instantly. Yes. It's a wonder he he was able to keep the car off of the wall. To be honest with you, I've never heard such a weird sound either. I thought it was the motor. Yeah, it sounded I think like everyone motor, did. It sounded like it was on five cylinders. Yeah, it didn't. It sounded like an engine. It was just, it, it's, you know what? It's kind. Of, it was kind of, uh, uh, kind of reminded me of uh, Hinchcliffe's vibration in in twenty eighteen when he had to abort his run and got bumped. All right. Which I mean, I mean, I mean, it. That was very. Uh, it really felt like that because I mean. When, when that happened to Hinchcliffe, I mean, Hinchcliffe, if there was rain after Harvey had that run of, like, 225, then, uh, uh, well, different story. I kind of want to jump into the uh, the fun part of this episode, which is us looking smart on the internet. Uh, I kind of want to hear your two picks, and then I'll go at the end, as uh, who you think is going to win, and then two dark horses and then any other predictions that you have for the race just throw them on as well in terms of you know do we think it's going to be a caution filled race or the opposite uh kyle why don't you lead off here uh i think i have to go off of uh my predictions video on youtube you and check it out on um, race nation tv here we go again um don't you dare <laughs> pull out the trends no well i mean the trends exist uh and I, I've already said it on the podcast, and it's in the video. Just you know, go on YouTube after this video and just race Nation TV with no spaces. Uh, I picked Takuma Sato uh, to win the uh, race. I, I kind of have to go with that. I still believe uh, it, the Ray Hall team has really solid race cars. Um, and my dark horses. Um, so, uh, oh, I got him. All right, a name that we really haven't said in this uh, show and talked about. Uh, Elio Castroneves would probably be my first dark horse. Uh, yeah, really good car in the fast nine. So he's got the starting position, which is something we've heavily discussed. Uh, Andretti equipment. I mean, come on. It's, uh, that car, I think and it's, what's funny is that's the, the dragon speed car, right? Yeah. Dragon speed chassis. He's got to realize that for a moment too. But yeah, I think Elio is my number one dark horse. Not a lot of people talking there about him. And then second dark horse would be Scott McLaughlin. 
Uh, Penske car is a dark horse, but he is a rookie. Um, he's looked really good in practice. Uh, the key for him, I think, is just going to not uh, get – it's just – well, I mean, this is pretty much key for everyone, but, I mean, especially for a rookie, uh, if he could just, you know, stay away from everything that's stupid during this race, I think he has a shot. Uh, so those are my picks. Oh, well, he didn't introduce me. So uh, I'll give you three names, Chris. Uh, Colton Herta, Alexander Rossi, Elio Castroneves. Uh, Herta's got a lot of good mojo, good juju coming his way. Uh, you got the Brian Herta connection. You got the um, 26 one in at uh, St. Pete. But more so, I think you've got a young driver who's due, who's coming into his own on the front row, driving as confidently as I've ever seen in his short career. Um, I think he's, uh, I think, honestly, he's probably the favorite, even more so than Dixon. I think a lot of people are, are kind of underselling him right now. Um, I think Alexander Rossi, you can never count him out. He's starting in, the, I think, the exact same position he started when he won in 2016. Um, he's, uh, he didn't quite get in the fast nine, but I never really used that necessarily as a barometer. He's been fast in traffic. He's been one of the fastest no-tow cars. Um, and, uh, you know, he's this modern uh, generation's Rick Mears, as far as I'm concerned. He's the only driver I've ever seen ever at the Indianapolis 500 that since his rookie year has had a chance to win every single Indy 500 he's ever been a part of. I think uh, that will not change this year, and I think it would be silly to ignore him. Um, uh, I think uh, Kyle kind of stole my thunder there with the Elio pick, but I think that his car has been extremely consistent. And I think in some ways, uh, he reminds me a lot of Sato last year. Uh, just kind of flew under the radar until he was there on race day. I think he's got the right equipment. I think he's motivated. He wanted his first race for Roger Penske uh, at Indianapolis. It uh, wouldn't surprise me one bit if he gets his fourth and wins his first for Meyer Shank Racing. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, and, I, and again, I, I mentioned this before, but I think if it's the Chevy, if the Chevy uh, can find some sort of an advantage, I don't think you can count out Reese VK, and I don't think you can count out Pato Award. Sounds very good. Um, I'm just going to go with the easy pick, and I hate to do it because I usually don't like doing this, but I just think the driver to beat this year has got to be Scott Dixon. Um, I mean, oh. well, okay, easy pick. Yes, I'll admit it, but I'll tell you what, Scott Dixon, we already mentioned in this episode that he had the car to win last year. Uh, if he had stayed in front of Sato, I think he would have won. I don't think a lot of people are willing to dispute that. Uh, I think, as David mentioned, he probably learned from that mistake. And, you know, maybe they made some tweaks to the race car this year that make it a little bit better following. The big thing with Dixon, though, as we've already said, is going to be if he wants to win, he's going to need to be out front or at least as close to the front as possible for a majority of the race. I think that's where the car is going to be the most comfortable. I haven't been at the track. I haven't seen what his car has been able to do in traffic as well as you guys have. But I think, you know, he had the race to win last year, sort of threw it away. I think yeah, that he threw might... it away. Well, yeah, sure. The reason but... he's only won the race once, Chris. Yeah, but I mean, take... the only time take... he won was when Dario didn't show up. Take yeah. A... <laughs> take, a <look> at... <laughs> take a look at who Scott Dixon is as a driver. I don't think... I agree with it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think Scott Dixon's going to be the type of driver to throw away an Indy 500 for the second year in a row based on the same mistake. So I think he's going to be trying as hard as he can to get out front, um, stay as close to the front as he can. Maybe he'll drop back to second or third at some point. I mean, he has a lot of teammates up there as well. Uh, as I had mentioned, all of the Chip Ganassi cars starting in the top nine, um, who certainly could put up a fight to drivers that are challenging Dixon, like Colton Herta, VK, uh, any of those other guys in the top nine. Ganassi has a pretty strong stable all around right now. And, you know, when it comes down to it, while I'm sure they're not going to be doing Dixon any favors, especially towards the end of the race, um, you know, you got to consider the fact that they are a team and um, and they're going to be able to help each other out a little bit throughout the race, keep the other guys at bay. Uh, let's see, some dark horse picks. You know, I just got to mention Ed Jones. I don't know what it is about Ed Jones. I'm not Matt Skipper. Uh, but he's been bringing it up, all, bringing up Ed Jones up all week. You know, he's starting 11th. I think Ed Jones, he's a driver that showed a lot of potential at Indianapolis in the past. Hell, almost won in 2017. I think that car, uh, while it isn't necessarily the best car in the field, if they're able to figure something out with strategy and find their way near the front, they're certainly not going to be in a bad position. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see Ed Jones pull off a surprising result. 
And then, you know, since in the, in the spirit of Dark Horse, since I gave you the easy pick for the winner, uh, I'm not going to pick somebody. Well, actually, before I go on, on that, I do want to say Takuma Sato, I think, is a, an extraordinarily good choice to pick as a winner. Um, you know, despite starting in 15th, I don't think that that's really too relevant. You have a 500 mile race, anything can happen. And, you know, making your way up from 15th into the top three, top five is certainly not going to be the hardest thing Sato's ever done in his career. So I, I certainly out, wouldn't discount him. Who's your out of the box pick? Is that RC Anderson? <laughs> yeah, I'll throw it out there. RC Anderson. No, but, um, <laughs> oh no, but you know, in the spirit of Dark Horse, as I said, even though I already gave a, a realistically good Dark Horse for uh, for the first one and Ed Jones, I'm going to say Stefan Wilson. Um, Yay! You know, Stefan Wilson almost pulled off that alternate strategy win in 2018. Uh, it didn't end up paying off. He had to pit with a few laps to go. I think, you know, he might be willing to try something like that again. Um, he has an Andretti car, obviously. He's been pretty strong all week. Hasn't been, you know, phenomenal by any means in terms of uh, raw pace but starting towards the back 28th place i think that they're going to be looking for out of the box strategy right from the get-go to find their way to the front if they have any chance at all and uh you know if i have to pick a huge dark horse that's who i'm going to go with because i certainly think that he has the maturity to win the race he's determined he doesn't get this opportunity every year and he's going to be almost hungrier than every than anybody in that field to find his way towards the front of the field so Stefan Wilson, as my. I'm surprised you didn't take the opportunity to pick Marco. Is it like the perfect Marco? Marco well, Dark? You know what, Marco Andretti. I'll tell you what, Marco is is going to find another way to just, to just lose the race this year. <laughs> you know, I but guess you're it, not can't, wrong. it can't get any more disappointing than last year, where um, where you know we sit through practice and you're like, okay, he's got a pretty good pretty good car. He's topping some of the charts in practice qualifying rolls around. He's going to be starting out front. Everybody thought that that race was going to be a race where the leader has the strongest advantage and you know sure that pretty much was the case for the most part he was the leader for about 100 feet yeah he didn't even hold on to the lead through turn one so it didn't even lead turn one so yeah um what's been really funny about marco this week i gotta tell you is you can tell all week that he just like got really pissed off after 2020 and through the entire week i think i maybe saw him do like four single car runs he he just literally just stayed in the in the garage until he saw a pad go out and just worked on race all week. You can tell he just did not care about qualifying at all. Well, I'll tell you what, if I'm in his shoes, I think that that's the best thing he could have done because, you know, you can point at 2020. He didn't have a great race by any means. His car certainly wasn't great last year. But look at 2019. I mean, that's a race where he really had an awful, awful car. And yet, you know, 2019, sure, he wasn't the pole sitter, but he still was pretty strong uh throughout practice and even qualifying that year but once they got into race trim i mean it, it just certainly i think by far he had the worst car in the field for that race watch watch this year be the year that being in the back of the pack bites him you know because you know you know this how the saying goes when you're back there with the squirrels you're bound to get your nuts kicked so i mean just watch well, there's a lot of guys back there who aren't normally back there and that usually spells trouble too i mean uh you know there's going to be guys who who are inexperienced or some gals who are inexperienced and you know will power is going to be driving around 10 cars on the first lap and you know it, that's when that's when things can get a little bit messy i'm not going to name names but there's been at least one driver out there that you know in the packs that, the four car that has looked like the teal car an absolute like just brick on track he's just getting passed left and right and race guys all the way to the apex of turn one yeah uh, side yeah. by side like inches apart for yep. real no good reason in practice well see so. the interesting thing to me is a lot of those guys that we look at as aggressive indy car drivers are starting pretty much in the second half of the field i think sato's driver everybody looks at as a very aggressive driver um you look at connor daly as well i think he's going to be fighting his way he's going to be punching out some positions uh joseph newgarden newgarden needs to have a pretty strong race for the championship's sake uh, especially where dixon's starting so I think he's going to be fighting like hell to try to get to the front. Addo's going to be stupid aggressive too. Santino Ferrucci in a Ray oh. Hall Letterman car. I mean, they have, you already know he's going to have a pretty strong car for the race. Drew's driving uh, for Ray Hall. 
and he's an aggressive driver in general. I think he's going to be somebody to look out for making his way through the field. Uh, you know, I think Marco Andretti as well. He has, what does he have now? 15, 15 years. You can't do it now. It's too late for that, Chris. Well, I, I'm just saying 15 years of driving at Indianapolis under his belt now. Um, 15 years of trying, 15 years of frustration. Yeah. Only four more until it's 20, and then we can truly complete full oh, circle. Boy. Um, if he doesn't run the three car, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> Will Power, too. I mean, I already know David mentioned him, but there's no way Will Power is going to be hanging around the back all day. So, what about some other predictions before I uh, before I move it on? We got about a half hour before I want to wrap this episode up, so I can be there for the premiere of my own stupid video. Um, Demona will finish two laps down. <laughs> what's that? Simona will finish two laps down. Well, okay, so Simona's okay. starting last. Right. But right. she's... Looks still... terrible in traffic. Just she, looks, she looks terrible in traffic. I yeah. thought you said the opposite, Kyle. No, I... She no. looked all right no, the no, first couple no. days. No, Let, hold on. Let me, let's be real here. The She gets passed, and she drives about 20 feet off the wall. I mean, uh, it, it's disappointing because I think Simona's a hell of a race car driver, um, but she's... Unfortunately, got in the short end of the stick with this year's Penske setup. It's just not good, and I don't think she has a, a ton of confidence right now. Um, it's uh, it's unfortunate, but I think I don't know if that team's really gonna. And, and I I could get bitten on this one. She could be the first driver to win from thirty third. I you know that could happen. Uh, and I think you know if she's in contention and they pull, do a weird fuel strategy, um, I think I think the thing for the Perrette Autosport team is stay on the lead lap. Um, and try to do some crazy fuel stuff, uh, Stefan Wilson style. But um, that car is just no good either. The Yunko's car, I think. Well, that, that could be part of it too. I think that's th something that a lot of people haven't talked about. I haven't talked about it because I knew uh, that that's the Yunko's car, and it's qualified thirty third twice, been the Bump Day Sweetheart twice. Kind of interesting. And the last time I ran, it cr crashed. It crashed. Yeah. The, oh, that's. Ooh. Right in front of where yeah, I'm sitting this year, yeah. Nice by saying she'll finish the race two laps down. I think she'll finish. She's she's pretty good at that. She's pretty good at finishing. Mm. So I, I smacked the wall on eleven and didn't finish. Yeah, that was young Simona though. She's 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 gotten better. If I remember correctly, I think that Pareto was saying that they had some snap over steer issues with that car uh, throughout qualifying. I don't know if they had the same issue yes, in race yes. trim. She had a big wiggle. Yep. At one point. But um, obviously, starting 33rd in the back of, you know, you're trailing 32 cars. If you have some snap over steer issues, it's not going to be doing you any favors. Um, you know, but I really do look at drivers like that who are starting in the back. I mean, let's be real. This isn't the Aero Kit era. This isn't 2012, 2013, 2014 even spec Aero Kit. Well, okay, it is spec Aero Kit, but it's not, it's okay. not a DW12 uh, with the bumpers, the original one. Or you could just pass two cars on one straightaway if you got a good enough draft. Um, you know, those guys in the back, they're going to have to be looking at alternate strategies, and that's what I mentioned with Stefan Wilson. Uh, he's no stranger to it. You know, I, I think that everybody in the back of the field, unless they get lucky, um, where they, you know, pit and then the yellow comes out and they cycle through a bunch of cars, or they cycle to the front of a bunch of cars, I think that they're going to be looking at some of those alternate strategies from early on. Um, I don't know. That's just one of my predictions for that race. Chris, you're getting to a point that I've, I've been making quite a bit. Um, and, and again, the video tomorrow, shout out, um, will be one where I'm going to very quickly make the, or very strongly make the point. Look, everybody always says there's, you know, 20 people who can win the Indy 500. I think that's crap because there may be 20 cars that are capable of winning the Indy 500, but there are not 20 drivers who are capable of winning the Indy 500 because how many drivers will be able on lap 195 to duel Tony Kanaan, Scott Dixon, Takuma Sato, and actually beat them? That's the key, and that's what you have to look for in the Indy 500. Who can win that duel at the end of the race? Because we almost always see it every single year. There's always two or three guys at the end of that race that are in contention and it's usually uh, a, a legendary or very uh, talented racing driver who wins out in the end well okay so 
when I'm saying make the way towards the front, I don't even necessarily mean leading. Um, but, you know, we're talking about, okay, one of the questions just got brought up, any last place predictions. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. But I certainly think, you know, especially for drivers like Will Power, regardless of the fact that you, you know, even if he doesn't win, he's going to be in the championship hunt this season, even though he's trailing pretty heavily right now. Um, drivers like Newgarden as well, they're going to want to find their way towards the front. Um, you know, even if the front doesn't necessarily mean the lead, I think top five, top 10 certainly would be a realistic goal for some of those guys, even if it means having to go on an alternate strategy to get there. But I certainly agree with you that, you know, we look at 2019, it came down to Simon Pagino and Alexander Rossi. We look at last year, it came down to Dixon and Sato. 2018 was pretty much just Will Power in the end. Um, and that's just the last three years right there. I think you're right with that. I do think, if anything, we're going to see a two-car duel at the end. Uh, you know, maybe a third driver sort of sneaking around a little bit. But it usually, in the past couple of years, has come down to two cars. And uh, I don't see any reason why this year would necessarily be any different unless we have some wild 2016-type play uh, out of nowhere. All right. Uh, I guess we should move it on because uh, at some point soon I'm going to want to wrap up this episode. So I think that covers covers it for Indianapolis stuff. There's going to be more stuff on uh, David's channel for sure. Uh, Kyle, I don't know what you're doing for content this week. But um, I'll have Cyrus Patchkey. What's that? Cyrus Patchkey. You'll you'll learn. You'll learn about Cyrus. You'll learn about Cyrus Patchkey. All right. Um. Anyways, just just stay tuned to their channels because they're obviously more nuanced with IndyCar stuff than I am at this time. And uh, if been you here wanna... for a week. Yes. I've been here for a month. I'm you being want... held against my will in Indianapolis. I've been both the grass. Help me. If you want the uh, the latest shit takes mixed in with some potentially decent predictions and, and rumors and news, you can go follow David on Twitter. <laughs> um, I, don't but... take. I don't recommend it. Now, not oh, Twitter. Wait. Just well, make sure you take one of my tweets and make a t-shirt out of it. And give me 10% of the... Did that actually happen? That really did happen. What do you that mean, really happened. What do you really mean happened. not Twitter? I've said that Dave. several times. There, you know what? Here's, here's something that's crazy about Indianapolis in May. There are some weird things that happen. we got to get you out of here, Chris, because you would just not believe some of the things... That we bumble ourselves into. That's oh, I'm, I'm what we're talking to, about now. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll try to get there I, next year. But I know what we're talking about now. Yeah. I'm on the same page with the joke now. It's all good. What is? Uh, okay. Okay. So I just realized I completely ignored the, uh, the question about last place <laughs> predictions. Um, I don't know, I'm just gonna throw a name out there because at the end of the day, it's gonna be somebody who ends up crashing, uh, which is really just anybody's game. Um, but I'll just I'll just say Dalton Kellett. I'll go easy again, um, since you guys have said his cars just look terrible in traffic. Did and, you know that positions thirty first through thirty third qualified faster than Dalton Kellett did on Saturday? Well, yes. Well, no, but I believe it because the track conditions on Sunday were hotter for the most part. No, th- well, that would mean that that would mean that. They should be slower than Dalton's time. You realize that. Because Dalton's last run was in the shade. And he, yeah. Oh, 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 so made, yeah. Okay. Remember he made the like, cockamamie yeah. run at the end right. of the day that everyone called him stupid for. But then right. we realized that the rules were written stupid so that once Will Power completed his time and was below 30th, that his his time was then nulled, which meant that even though, even though Dalton Kellett pulled his original time, even though he qualified back in the 30th, that time still stood, which meant even though Will Power's run was faster than Kellett's, Kellett still stood in 30th. But fun fact, he is, in fact, slower than 30th through 33rd, and he is starting in 30th. So is that your is that your prediction as well, Kyle? Yeah, David's going to... I'm going to leave my house to uh, live in a hotel because of ants. I'm staying here. But the first, yeah, Kyle is going to stay in my own house while I have to go to a... How do you figure that 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 deal out? But the uh, the important key is first driver out of the race, James Hinchcliffe. Just have a feeling. I have no idea why. There we go. All right, peace. Peace. What All were right. you saying, Chris? Right. So, so we we lost David because he's leaving his own house. 
Um, yeah. Okay. There's a lot of crazy things happening tonight. Yeah. You know, what? I'll, I'll tell you what, Kyle. I'm actually glad I'm not in Indy this year. I wouldn't want to be having to sleep with ants. You know, I'm not paying. It's for not ants. Just... It's, it's only in one room. An exterminator came today. It's fine. You know what? But Save it, it for next year. Fixed. Hopefully, you get fixed. Get that problem fixed by next year. It's fine. Man. Yeah, it will so be you... fixed. You got... The ant problem happened in the room or go, on a mattress. Go to, your, go to your Best Western, man. All right. It's a Motel Six, actually. It's a oh, Motel no, Six surprised. studio. What, do you do you have a like a rewards? I didn't say where it was. Do you have a rewards? Important part of what, where it is, man. Oh my god! You know, if there's somebody who shows up in a do you know how many like, Motel Sixes there are? It's like five. Well, you didn't have to say it. You didn't have to say that. Do That's you, on you now. Do you know how many <laughs> concurrent viewers we have right now? Hey, it only takes one. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> All right, no. Kyle, that's that's all on you too. I don't want to hear anything on my on my name there. Listen, 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 Chris. Uh, this month has been an eye-opening experience for me. There are people and places that I would have never expected to be watching and paying attention to me. So I'm just saying, holy smokes! I better watch what I say sometime. All right, Kyle. I I think we got sidetracked a little bit. So do you want to uh, just throw a name out there and answer the question? What question? What? So who's finishing last in the race? Don't kill it. All right, you're just going with mine. Okay. So well, it's get... an easy. It's it's well, sure, it makes yeah. sense. But at I the end of the day, my point. at the end of the day, yes, it is going to be the first one out of the race. I was making crash, my so. point that he is the slowest starter in the field. Yeah. Or or if it's and not a crash, he it's going to be worst in race traffic. If, if it's Nothing not, against Dalton, but the it's not going it's not going well. If it's not a crash, then uh, it's going to be from somebody's brakes going big boom like Davis in last year. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> all right, so we have about fifteen minutes here before I want to hop off. I don't think, even think we're going to spend that. Uh, I don't think we're going to spend that much time, anyways. Uh, Kyle, did you watch the Monaco Grand Prix? Um, why did I have to? Nothing happened. Well, the garage door and the electrician is coming. If I don't get wait, the garage door is not. Oh, it's it's the garage door is open. Yeah. Why? <laughs> what? I don't know. We opened it up for some reason. I don't remember why. Can you close that real quick? Well, you're, when, you're leaving. You're literally going to the driveway. Right. Right. Okay. Fine. I didn't Thank know you. If you need anything out there. Thank you. No. Okay. Also, the electrician is coming. Remember that. Yeah, and you're not going to be here if you're own. No, I'm going to come. I just don't know. But if, if he shows up at eight in the morning, right. and I'm driving. I'm just saying. All right. All right. He doesn't just open the door and be like, hi. Hi. Get to work. Okay. So, so Kyle, so, so yes, you're kind of right. Uh, as Monaco <laughs> Grand Prix go, this was actually probably the, one of the least interesting ones in recent years. Um, the biggest notable thing, I guess there's a couple of notable things, mainly from qualifying. Um, Charlotte Claire, Charles Leclerc um, qualified on pole. First time Ferrari's been on pole since 2019. I don't remember the race. Uh, some point in the later stages of 2019, um, which was, you know, it really kind of came as a surprise to me a little bit. I'm curious if Ferrari's going to be able to hold that pace throughout the summer, if that was really just a Monaco as a track thing uh, as to why they had a lot of pace. But both Leclerc and uh, Sainz, pretty strong throughout the weekend uh, with Carlos Sainz finishing second. Now, in the race, Mercedes, you know, it was sort of one of their hungry 2019 moments where uh, where they just have nothing go well for them. Uh, Valtteri Bottas, the, his pit crew stripped the... the uh, <laughs> I can't call it a lug nut. Uh, what, what am I going to call it? The, the the thing that spins onto the wheel that keeps the wheel on yes. the, the hub. Yeah, I can't call it a lug nut though. Maybe it's that's not a lug nut. I, no, no, no. Um, you know what I mean? Just a bolt. I don't know. I don't know the, the the name for it. Uh, completely stripped it though. Actually, there's a picture online. I saw it on Instagram. Uh, like I feel so... stupid for not knowing the name of that, but at the same time I don't because I feel like that that it has something like. Uh, hmm. I think I think Formula One posted it on their Instagram if you want to see a picture of it if you haven't yet. Um, they had to retire that car though simply because they couldn't get the front right tire off. 
after Botas was in second. Now, uh, Verstappen was able to sort of block Botas at the at the start of the race. Problem with Monaco, you just can't pass. Uh, that like, and the cars are huge nowadays. There was one or tr- two on track overtakes. Um, the entire race, and one of them got completely obscured by F1 TV direction, which you know people have been up in arms about. But honestly, I kind of thought it was a little David, bit funny. Um, what do you, what do you call the like lug nut on an F1 car? <laughs> the center bolt. What? Do you... A wheel nut. Wheel oh, nut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said the wheel nut. Okay. Yeah. We, we we knew we couldn't call it a lug nut. It's a wheel nut. Yeah. Right, wheel nut. We knew we couldn't call it a lug nut, but we couldn't figure that's it out. That's what NASCAR is going to use next year. Yes. By the way, call them wheel nuts. Yes. And just annoy the NASCAR fans. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah, the electrician is definitely coming at 8 a.m. tomorrow. 8? 8 a.m. Oh, my I'll God. I'll try to be here. I'll try to be here, but, man. What are you getting me into? I'm not getting you into anything. You chose to stay here. I'm mowing your lawn. I'm... I'm... You I'm waking up. I'm no, waking up for electricians. I tried, easy, I tried to give you the easy job, which was edging. You're like, no, I want to move on. I'm like, okay. I. It looks good, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It looks a lot better than it did when I just didn't mow it for a week because I had to get up at you know ten o'clock in the morning, go to the racetrack, not come back till seven o'clock at night, and then edit for three hours. <laughs> yeah. By the way, people of the internet, this is a job. <laughs> <laughs> how did we get sidetracked again <laughs> what how do we get sidetracked again i don't know man. Go to your best Monica. western man you... <laughs> we're um we're i mean if this is any indication how boring monaco was you even get sidetracked while talking about Listen, the like you're to be into my house and fixing like the half of the wall that doesn't have plugs is way more exciting than Max Verstappen driving around a city street in a car that's nearly as wide as the road itself. That is okay, true. I'm really excited right, well, for right. all well, of let, these plugs. Well, let me let me let me uh, let me talk about that real yeah, quick yeah, here with, because with, I, on that note, I actually need to go drive on 460 or not 460. Why are you that's describing where you're going to be? I, the, the, people, everybody knows I'm in Indianapolis. I didn't go any more specific than that. At least you're a girl at the, at the turkey. With stop it. No, 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 no. Mother. Stop, stop, stop. All right. Hey, Kyle. So I, I have a quick bone to pick here with that because because I have 10 minutes and I want to talk about people have been saying, how can we improve Monaco as a track? Just don't. All right. And this is going to come Make off the as car a smaller. Exactly. Make the car smaller. Bring back refueling. It's 2021. Surely you can figure out a way. Surely you can figure out a way to... Uh, to bring back refueling in a safe manner where you're not going to have fires down the pit lane every few weekends. Literally every other series does it. Exactly. Uh, You know, that's Monaco's never been the most exciting race. And I think a big thing with Monaco is there's the people who say it needs to be off the schedule are actually, you know, they just don't really understand. They They don't don't really understand it. Yeah. I mean, I would still rather have Monaco on the schedule than, pretty much every other race you know as weird as it sounds to say i think a big part of monaco is just the prestige of it and the history of it i mean qualifying is the whole thing you see how fast they're going around that tiny track like damn yeah i mean that's it's it really is sort of a spectacle rather than an entertainment value um but you know i wouldn't sacrifice the race for for another shitty street circuit somewhere else uh, you know, which is a trend that we're getting recently. Uh, but anyway, yes. Yeah, so you certainly have to make the cars smaller if you want the racing to get better there. There's nothing you can really do to change the track layout. You've built an entire city around the track. I mean, uh, have you those, seen like the comparison of how? Like, have you seen the comparison of how small the cars were in like 2008? Oh, now? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's I mean, just, just look at a picture of that, and that'll tell you everything to why Monaco. It's was, night and day. Is. You know, and they were putting better races on back then. Granted, you know, they they, were, they weren't A plus grade races, but they were better yeah. races than we have now, and they didn't have DRS. Yeah, um, not exactly. Like so, uh, anyway, that was just something that I had to get out there. Um, you know, this podcast has sort of gone off the rails a little bit uh, towards the I, end. At least, um, I hope it's entertaining. At least, I hope that was entertaining. I think he's actually left now. He he, he brought water back in. 
went to the bathroom. I, I think he's I now I think he's gone. I think he's I think he's good. I don't know. A lot's happened. <laughs> uh yes. Okay. Um so Max Verstappen won the race pretty dominant fashion, never really looked back from the start and took the championship lead. I think that's probably the most notable storyline from this weekend going forward uh, is that he is now holding a four-point lead on Lewis Hamilton. And that's sort of something I said in last week's episode with Joe is, you know, Hamilton didn't need... or I, I Verstappen didn't need uh, necessarily to win the race. He just needed Hamilton to have pretty mediocre weekend and that's exactly what he had when they screwed up the pit strategy i mean hamilton was pretty livid with his team uh given the fact that they had told him to save his tires early on and then managed to pit him early uh which is pretty much the exact opposite of what you want to be doing uh and it ended up costing them you know essentially two positions between uh sebastian vettel and pierre gasly um lando norris another pretty impressive finish from him still holding third in the championship uh 56 points right now so you know around half of what we're seeing from the two leaders in the championship but you know i guess we'll consider the best of the rest for now um and you know a stark contrast to his teammate at mclaren and daniel ricardo who you know once again had a pretty disappointing weekend starting in qualifying um you know daniel i think has been a driver that a lot of people thought would be a, a podium contender for a lot of weekends uh, with that McLaren C. You know, we're, we're only a few races in to the season, but um, I don't think he's been performing quite as well as a lot of people have been expecting. I already touched on Ferrari um, and their sort of return to success for now, at least. Um, I'll be curious to see how that carries throughout the summer. And Red Bull is holding a one-point lead in the constructor standings over Mercedes at this time. So, a lot to see in F1 going forward. We're sort of back where we were with 2018 now, where a team that isn't Mercedes pulls a lead in the championship in the middle of the season. I think Ferrari lost it at, uh, what was it, Canada or Germany that year. Um, And then Mercedes sort of never looked back again. Um, so it's really going to be, as I had mentioned with Joe in the last podcast, a season uh, about momentum for Red Bull Racing, how well they can hold on to consistent one, my first and second finishes uh, for Max Verstappen because you know, Mercedes is a team that isn't going to give up until the very last race. So they're going to have to be on their A game throughout the summer and the rest of the season as a whole. All right. <laughs> I think that's going to be enough to wrap up this episode of the rain race podcast sort of went off the rails a little bit uh but this is probably our best podcast let's be honest i think i think a net gain because david did give us some pretty reasonable insight i'm you know as unfortunate as it is to say i haven't been able to pay as much attention to indycar this month as i would have wanted to uh you know usually practice would be going on from noon to six and i would end up having to go into work around three so i'd miss you know a good half of practice every single day and then um, with qualifying and even having to take a, a summer course for college, um, it just missed more than I would have wanted to this past week. But next week we will be doing a race recap where I get to actually watch the entire race and, uh, and recap everything that went on. Um, so I want to set this in stone right now, Kyle. Next Monday we're doing an episode, Monday night at 8. Um, I'll be at Lawrenceburg watching the World of Outlaws. Never mind. Okay. Perhaps Tuesday night we'll see you um, for another episode of the Rain Race Podcast. Uh, look for it again around 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, somewhere around then. I'll try my best to advertise all that stuff on Twitter um, and Instagram and all those platforms. For now, four minutes from now, I will be doing a premiere of my latest video right here on my YouTube channel, so you can stick around. Join me for that premiere and uh, it can all be a nice, fun time. Until the next episode of the Rain Race Podcast, thank you all so much for tuning in. Hope to see you next week, next Tuesday, uh, at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight for another episode. Take care and enjoy the Indianapolis 500.